Perfect. Uh, so uh, thanks, uh, Yasu, for the introduction and uh, well, and for the invitation to, to speak at the seminar. I'm very excited to be speaking here, what uh, could almost be a uh, 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 seminar in the room in Concordia, uh, especially since uh, this uh, particular project uh, started uh, uh, during uh, multiple uh, discussions that I had uh, with uh, Alina. Uh, in Concordia. Uh, okay, so uh, so let's. I don't think my screen is being broadcasted. Is is it my fault? We don't see it now. I think you should share it. Looks promising. Great. Yes. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Very good. There is a big delay. Okay. Apologies. Uh, so uh, let's start. We have a convex body in a ren. We will be assuming it is uh, compact and that uh, it has an empty interior. And I'm going to define uh, two metrics on its interior. The first one is the funk metric, uh, which is uh, can be given just by uh, a formula. So the funk distance defined by k between two points x and y is given uh, as follows. You draw an interval from x to y until it intersects k at the point b. And you look at the ratio of uh, the larger interval to the smaller one, take the logarithm, and that's your distance. So obviously, it's uh, non-symmetric. Uh, also, it is uh, invariant under uh, affine transformations. And one can show that it's a distance function. So uh, while that looks a bit uh, ad hoc, it is actually uh, the simplest metric uh, you can define uh, a fine in a, a fine invariant way on the interior on the interior and the way to see it is by looking at it as a Finsler metric so uh, what you do you look at a point uh, in the interior let's suppose it's x and uh, you need I, I need to tell you what is the norm on the tangent space at this point or equivalently what is the unit ball of this norm there and the unit ball is just well here it is uh, just k except you think of x as the origin of this norm in this tangent space uh, and one can compute that it gives exactly this distance function um, okay uh, so we will sometimes use the notation for the norm which is like this and uh, that's the norm with this uh, unit ball okay uh, the other distance uh, distance function that they want to define is the Hilbert metric, which is nothing else but the uh, symmetrization of the funk metric. Well, it's not symmetric, like symmetric metrics. Uh, so we just take the arithmetic mean. And what you get is, uh, well, uh, now you need to extend uh, the interval both ways. So we get A and B. Uh, there's a huge delay between what I'm saying and what you see on the screen. Okay. Uh, and what you get is uh, one half the logarithm of uh, this cross ratio of uh, four points on a line, which is, of course, a projective invariant. So uh, what we ended up getting is yet another Finsler uh, metric, which gives a distance, which is a projectively invariant. And moreover, uh, it generalizes the uh, Beltrami Klein hyperbolic metric, which is what you get if you start with a Euclidean uh, ball or more generally an ellipsoid. And this is how Hilbert arrived at this metric. And uh, the Hilbert metric has been uh, quite uh, popular and quite uh, intensively studied uh, by uh, various people. So uh, one reason is that uh, well, the Hilbert metric uh, actually also the funk metric, uh, they uh, minimize, uh, they, they're minimizing the geodesics are just uh, straight segments. So that's uh, a nice property. And uh, that was also the topic of Hilbert's fourth problem, find all metrics uh, we, that have such property. And the two examples he had in mind are the uh, norm spaces and the uh, Hilbert metrics. Uh, uh, so, and due to its projective invariance, Hilbert metric is a very uh, useful tool when you come to study convex projective structures. On manifolds, it replaces uh, the hyperbolic uh, Riemannian metric on uh, hyperbolic uh, surfaces. 
Mitya, so, uh, uh, yes. uh, uh, silly question. So suppose you start with a convex set, not in Euclidean space, but on a sphere or in a hyperbolic plane. Can you sort of redo uh, all, uh, well, all well, the steps? Uh, well, so uh, I, I never did anything in Euclidean space. I started with uh, a fine uh, space. There's oh. there, no, no Euclidean uh, was used, but what you ask, I think does uh, have, uh, so it, it is a valid question. Uh, there is a construction of, a, I think, a Hilbert matrix also in a hyperbolic and spherical spaces. There is nothing I can tell you about it, but I think those things exist, yes. Um, mm -hmm. but, but we did it, so uh, we only used the defined structure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, and uh, in both of those uh, metrics, I will need a notion of volume. A M, okay, it, it does move after 10 seconds. I will need a notion of volume, and we're going to use the Holmes Thompson volume. So, basically, in uh, Finstler geometry, there are many ways you can define volume. There are more or less two, maybe three ones that are used. The two most common ones are the Busemann definition of volume, which is the same as the Hausdorff uh, measure. And uh, for metric geometers, that's probably the, the first choice. But uh, for many purposes, uh, particularly if you are an integral geometer or a symplectic geometer, the Holmes-Thompson definition is the more natural one. And uh, it happens to be the one that we, we need. So. Uh, I want to give the general definition, but in those two particular cases, here are the precise uh, descriptions of those measures. We are in a fine space, so we have some Lebesgue measure. So for the Funk uh, volume, the density at point X is just the volume of the dual convex body with respect to this very point X, which, uh, well, here it's says exactly what it means. So you shift the origin to X, you take the dual body and uh, you take its volume. So uh, here you have some Lebesgue measure, here you, here you have a Lebesgue measure on the dual space. Their product is uh, invariant of, uh, of any choice that you uh, might make. Okay, and uh, I see that I forgot here uh, the X. In the Hilbert space, it's very similar, except uh, you take the dual space, uh, the, the dual body, and you symmetrize it. And uh, you take the volume of that thing. This is the density uh, of the Hilbert uh, Holmes-Thompson volume. Okay, uh, and uh, one object of interest uh, for us will be, okay, may maybe before the object of interest, let me uh, stop and say that this talk is going to be mostly about the Funk metric. Well, people studied Hilbert metric uh, quite intensively. Funk has been mostly overlooked uh, and uh, ignored. I'm not quite sure why, maybe because it well, doesn't have uh, projective invariance, maybe because it's named after Funk, maybe because it's not symmetric, I don't know. It's, uh, but uh, it, it has some very nice properties that have obviously been just uh, overlooked. And uh, I will try to convince you. Uh, of that uh, today. Okay, so we will be looking at metric balls in the funk metric. They're very easy to describe. They're just, uh, well, because it's a non-symmetric metric, we should uh, be careful and uh, and insist on looking at outwards uh, balls. So we'll go from the center to the point. It should be no greater than R. And they turn out to be just a uh, homothetis of the uh, body defining the geometry around the center, and that's the coefficient. This is how it depends on the radius. Uh, okay, so uh, we're at the next page. We're going to assume now that uh, uh, zero is in the interior of K for the most part, and we're going to define uh, this uh, quantity, MR of K and Q, uh, to be just the volume of this metric ball. And if you write it explicitly using uh, the descriptions before, you're just looking at the integral over a rescaled copy of K of the volume of the polar with respect to this point. 
So there are some uh, basic properties that you can establish. Uh, first of all, uh, as a function of Q of the center is going to be a convex function on uh, the interior of K. And uh, so for instance, if you know that K is symmetric with respect to some center, then uh, you know this is going to be uh, well, an a minimum of the function. Then you can look at invariance uh, properties. So uh, once again, by construction, it's uh, uh, invariant under the linear group, but it has uh, one further uh, peculiar uh, invariance property. Uh, it's invariant under uh, duality. So if you replace K with K polar, uh, doesn't change. That's, uh, that's a good sign uh, that it's a natural quantity. Uh, for instance, the Hilbert uh, corresponding Hilbert invariant uh, would not have this property. Uh, and then you look at the asymptotics. Uh, for instance, when the radius goes to zero, uh, it's quite uh, immediate to see that what you recover with some uh, asymp uh, rate element is the uh, volume product or the Mahler volume, k times k polar, which uh, has been uh, an object of uh, intensive study by the convex geometry community. Uh, perhaps more interesting is what happens when you look uh, when you look at the radius when it goes to infinity. So here I'm going to assume that uh, the boundary is sufficiently regular. And then it's a result of uh, Berg, uh, Bernick and Wernicke's that uh, the asymptotics uh, is uh, exponential with uh, this rate. And the dependence of, on k uh, is encoded in the coefficient. The coefficient turns out to be the uh, center affine surface area, uh, which is a classical uh, semi-continuous solution on uh, convex bodies. It is given uh, like so. So uh, maybe let me just spell it out. Uh, you integrate over the boundary. Uh, the Gaussian curvature to some power divided by the distance of the supporting hyperplane to some power. Okay, that's the definition. And uh, right. So um, we have two uh, classical quantities, the Mahler volume and the center of fine surface area. And uh, they have been studied. In particular, the following is well known. So uh, let's assume uh, from now on uh, that the center of mass or the centroid of K is uh, fixed uh, at uh, the origin. So uh, the blaschke law inequality says that the Mahler volume is maximized by the Euclidean ball or uh, due to GLN invariance also by any ellipsoid. Uh, we also have a result of uh, Lutwak from uh, 94 which says that the center of fine surface area is uh, maximized by uh, ellipsoids. And uh, of course, at this point, it makes sense to uh, put forward the, uh, well, what uh, should be called the uh, funk blaschke Centolo inequality, conjectured inequality, that for all uh, finite values of the radius, this uh, quantity, m r of k, is maximized uniquely by ellipsoids. So I don't know how to prove this conjecture. Uh, I know how to prove it in one particular case. And uh, this is what I'm going to uh, present. So uh, this inequality uh, holds uh, when K is unconditional, where uh, unconditional uh, means that uh, when you look at a point inside K and you change the sign of uh, any of the coordinates, uh, you stay inside K. That's a class of convex bodies that appears frequently in convex geometry. For instance, the Mahler conjecture is wide open, but for such bodies, uh, people know how to prove it. Of course, it's uh, not very natural in terms of the, the problem itself. The problem is GLN invariant, and here we show some coordinates. It's weird, but uh, that, that's uh, that's. Uh, what uh, works. Okay, Be and before I explain in rough terms how to prove it, uh, I want to discuss relations to some other 
questions, uh, for instance, the Hilbert geometry. So uh, in Hilbert geometry, one quantity people have been interested in for some time is the volume entropy. Uh, what's that? You look at the metric ball of radius r, you look at its volume, and you want to know how fast it grows as the radius goes to infinity. And the uh, crudest uh, quantification of that is uh, is the following, you take the logarithm of the volume and divide by r and take uh, the lim soup or sometimes lim inf and you call it the, the volume entropy. So uh, you're saying that uh, your volume of a ball of radius r is going to be something like entropy times the radius. And uh, the question, uh, is how large the entropy can be. For instance, in a paper of uh, Kolba and uh, Verovic Ver from uh, 2004, the conjecture was put forward that the entropy is at most n minus one, uh, which is uh, which is the entropy of a hyperbolic space, which is what you have if k is an ellipsoid. Uh, but it's actually far from being uh, sharp. So uh, whenever you have a strictly convex uh, C to smooth uh, body, uh, you're going to get the same entropy. So this conjecture has been established uh, re relatively recently so, uh, by Tolosan in uh, 17 and uh, almost simultaneously using completely different methods by uh, Vernikos and Walsh. And uh, I want to explain how the uh, funk blaschke sontelo inequality, in fact, uh, gives a, a strengthening of this result. Of course, whenever you can uh, prove it. Uh, so uh, why is that? Well, uh, the uh, funk uh, volume is comparable to the Hilbert volume. So you can find some constant Cn prime and Cn such that they are uh, comparable. That's uh, that's uh, some basic uh, convex geometry. Uh, also, you have an inequality between the distances, right? Because the Hilbert distance is symmetrization of the funk distance. You have this uh, inequality. And that means that a Hilbert ball of radius r is contained inside the funk ball of uh, radius uh, 2r. And uh, that uh, allows you to do this chain of inequalities. If you look at the Hilbert volume of a Hilbert ball, it's bounded from above by the Funk volume of the Funk ball. And then by the Funk Blaschke Santella inequality, you can just maximize it by the ball and see what you get. Uh, you get the, uh, the correct uh, entropy expression. This is the, the entropy we're after. So uh, of course the maximal entropy conjecture is some asymptotic inequality, and here we have something uh, sharp uh, for every finite value of radius. Uh, okay, and uh, it seems fitting to also uh, say something about the Mahler conjecture. Uh, so. Uh, once again, the very famous conjecture in convex geometry that the Mahler product here is minimized by the simplex. There is also a symmetric version. So if k uh, is symmet centrally symmetric, k equals minus k, then the conjecture is that it's minimized by the cube. There are also other minimizers. And uh, it's wide open, so uh, it's basically also only known in in uh, the plane and in the symmetric case very recently. Also, uh, three-dimensional Mahler conjecture was established by Iri and Shibata. So here, the, the nice thing is that uh, at least asymptotically, the Mahler conjecture in the Funk or, or in the Hilbert setting is uh, is a theorem. So, uh, a theorem of uh, the very same Vernikos and Walsh from uh, 2018 says that if you uh, look at the rate of growth of balls in the Hilbert geometry, when the radius goes to infinity, uh, it's minimized by the simplex. 
And uh, okay, so uh, at this point, you would like to conjecture that uh, for all values of R, it is minimized by the simplex. And uh, yeah, uh, that's uh, that's uh, wide open, more general than the Muller conjecture, so uh, not easy. Okay, uh, I have nothing else to say about Muller. I wanted to uh, say, uh, give the main steps uh, of the proof in the unconditional case, that's a seminar and analysis. So I can't just throw words into the air, I need to write some formulas. Um, yeah, first I was thinking to try writing the proof in real time, but then decided my handwriting is bad as it is. No need to put it to strings, but I'll try to go slowly. So um, we introduced this parameter row, uh, which uh, depends on R, that's the homotopy coefficient. And this is the quantity we're trying to maximize. Okay, uh, the first step is to write uh, this as power series in row. That's uh, not very hard to do if you assume central symmetry, which we do. It's, uh, we actually assume more, we assume unconditionality. Then you find that the coefficients of the power series are those numbers that depend on k with i to j k, uh, which are uh, similar to the Mahler volume, except you're integrating not one, but the product of x and xi to power two j. Now, there is one piece of good news. In uh, 1988, Keith Ball considered uh, this quantity uh, when j equals one, so he looked at i2, and he proved that for unconditional k, uh, this quantity is maximized uh, by ellipsoids. So that's good, uh, but we need uh, this for all values of j, and uh, his method doesn't seem to allow taking higher j, so we need to do something else. And what we're going to do, we're going to consider the functional version. What does it mean? Well, uh, now the argument is going to be not a convex body, but some function that they choose to write in this funny fashion, e to minus phi. And uh, the integral, so, so uh, you, you should be thinking of the indicator function of k being replaced by some more general function. So now we're integrating over all our n and all of the dual our n. And this is uh, what uh, stands instead of k. And this is what stands instead of k dual. So what is this? Well, uh, the Legendre transform of phi is, uh, I, I guess you've all seen it, uh, is given by this formula. Sometimes it could be infinity. That only makes means the integral is zero and uh, that's uh, not helping for maximization. So that's not a problem. Uh, so uh, th that's uh, the one of the notions of duality for functions, replacing duality of convex bodies. So uh, we are looking at that, and uh, one can show that uh, there is this nice relation, the coefficients i to j of k uh, coincide with uh, the corresponding function of i to j when you plug e to minus one half norm square norm with k being the unit ball of the norm. So I guess it's uh, standard, but let me just write it. Is the norm where k is unit ball. Okay, uh, so uh, we're now in the business of maximizing uh, functionals of functions. And that's sometimes uh, easier, as it turns out. Uh, so uh, the next step is to slightly uh, simplify the expression. We look at uh, this product and we just write it in the coordinates. This is where we rely heavily on unconditionality. Uh, open brackets, a lot of things vanish. And what you're left with is this uh, product of two integrals, that's where uh, unconditionality is crucial. It allows the separation of x and xi into two integrals. Uh, so we're looking at various uh, multi-indices i. 
and uh, we're trying to maximize this product of integrals. Okay, and uh, at this point, I probably lost everyone, uh, but uh, but there's no way of knowing. So let's uh, carry on. Um, we're trying to maximize this product, which looks a lot like the Mahler pro product for functions, except there is uh, the extra things here. And uh, here it turns out that the, one of the proofs for uh, Blaschke uh, Santillo for functions, uh, specifically the one by uh, Joseph Lehek, just uh, goes through uh, without uh, almost any change. The key keywords uh, that uh, go in are uh, you should uh, make an exponential change of variables and then uh, apply the Precopolindler inequality. So that's nice. Uh, we're just putting together some known technologies and uh, get a new result. I, I, I will skip the, the details. Let's just uh, move on. Okay, uh, so in the second half of the talk, which starts now, I will be talking about uh, billiards mostly. By the way, if you lost me, th that's a good time to, to come back. Uh, there will be nice pictures and uh, almost no proofs. Uh, okay. Mitya, I'm sorry, yeah. can you just go back for a second to the to the main conjecture that you had? Uh, yes, I can. I think you're referring to this one. Uh, well, right, the Blaschke, the, yeah, the, exactly. Yes. So, uh, so I, uh, I, I, I sort of missed the following thing. So for the, for the Hilbert metric. Yes. Uh, so what, what is the state, like, what is, is there an analog or like, uh, what happens well, with this conjecture uh, yes. if you replace right. Funk so, by Hilbert? For, uh, mm -hmm. uh, so you have to be a bit careful. Uh, the reason you need to be careful is because in Hilbert metric, uh, Hilbert metric is projective invariant. So any invariant you're going to construct out of it is not going to be continuous in the Hausdorff topology in convex sets because, uh, because the projective uh, action on convex sets is uh, ha has a dense orbit. Uh, so uh, you have to be careful. For instance, uh, one way to, to avoid this complication is uh, to restrict your attention to symmetric convex sets. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, yes, then you can conjecture that uh, in the Hilbert metric, a ball of uh, Hilbert radius around the origin uh, maximize, uh, is uh, maximized by ellipsoid. Yes, I think uh, that's, a, that's a perfectly valid conjecture. But is it sort of kind of, uh, I'm, I'm just trying to understand uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in which sense kind of Funk metric is different or better than Hilbert metric. So uh, uh, for so instance, is it true that if you have some conjecture statement for a Funk metric and then for uh, symmetric convex bodies, it will be also probably true for, for the Hilbert metric? I don't feel I'm in a position to give you an affirmative answer to that, uh, but uh, Funk metric is easier. It's more, it's simpler, it's more natural in a way. It doesn't force some symmetrization. And I think this is why, well, just I know how to prove something about the funk metric. Or, well, I don't know how to prove the corresponding results for mm -hmm. There are also results where you, you can prove the same for, for both, especially things like uh, and volume entropy conjecture, which is uh, rather, uh, uh, N not very sensitive invariant, so it doesn't really care about whether or not you do symmetrization. Uh, and uh, okay. Uh, um, okay, sorry. Yes, I, I didn't want to distract you. So from there's also somebody sending emails. Um, okay, uh, so uh, Hilbert metric. Uh, uh, also, so there will be one further uh, 
strong point for Funk over Hilbert that will become evident when we discuss uh, billiards. Um, okay, so let's discuss billiards. Okay, so what, what are billiards? Uh, we have a K uh, and we're looking at some, uh, at some uh, billiard table inside K, Omega. And, and uh, there will be some regularity and assumption on the boundaries of both of them, which I will not be uh, very precise about. Okay, what is billiard? So you start with uh, Q0, uh, you, you want, to get to Q2, we say that Q0, Q1, Q2 are consecutive points of uh, the billiard. If uh, when you look at the distance function L of X, which measures distance from Q0 to some point X and from X to Q2, remember the metric is not symmetric, so we have to be careful a bit. Uh, but if this distance function has a critical point at uh, Q1. Uh, okay, and now uh, you can ask, uh, Okay, so now given three points, we know what if they're in a billiard orbit or not, but uh, that's not how you play billiard. You send the ball from Q0 to Q1 and you want to see where it ends up. So uh, there is a, a description of the reflection law, uh, which was given by Tabash, uh, by Gutkin and Tabashnikov. Uh, in the paper where it introduced uh, Finsler billiards. Uh, and let me uh, tell you what it says in the particular case of uh, Funk billiards. So you start from Q0, you go to Q1, oh, have the straight line, and you extend it until it intersects the boundary of K. And now you draw tangent lines. This is one tangent line. This is another tangent line. You get an intersection point. Now you draw a third tangent line until it hits here. And this is the new direction. So basically, the way to think about it is you are going from Q0 to Q1 in this direction, which is given by the point here. And you're now going in this direction, which is going by the new point here. That's the reflection law. And uh, as you uh, might notice, it's projectively invariant. We only talk about tangency, intersection, straight lines. Uh, also, I'm talking in the plane, but uh, everything immediately extends to general dimension. Let's consider an example. Let's look at the Euclidean unit ball. K is a Euclidean unit ball. And uh, you can just write uh, what the Finsler the corresponding uh, funk uh, Finsler norm is, and it has two uh, summons. So uh, this is uh, just the Beltrami Klein metric, right? If you symmetrize funk, I already told you, it should be the Beltrami Klein, and you can see that this summon is odd in the vector, so when you symmetrize it, it disappears. So what you get is the Beltrami Klein metric. The second summand is a one form on the tangent space. Moreover, it's an exact one form. And uh, this has some very striking consequences. So uh, it's just a simple observation and immediate corollary, but uh, still uh, somewhat surprising. For instance, uh, that means that uh, the funk billiards and the hyperbolic billiards uh, they coincide right, for any shape of omega. Moreover, if you look at the length spectrum of the hyperbolic billiard inside omega, which is the length of closed orbits, uh, it doesn't matter if you measure the hyperbolic or the funk length, that's the same. So th that gives a projective geometric way to look at hyperbolic billiards. For instance, you can translate the theorem about integrability of uh, billiard orbits inside conics in a hyperbolic space as a result just about conics in projective space. Okay, so that's that's fun, but uh, that's, maybe that's just some games we're playing. Uh, is it good for anything? Well, it turns out that something more, uh, something like this happens in, in, in a full generality. 
Uh, so here is the, the statement, which is not hard to check. It's more of an observation. If you start with anybody K and you apply, start with anybody K and you apply some projective transformation, it's also called the collineation, uh, I learned recently, such that uh, it keeps K uh, compact. Projective transformation applied to a convex body is still a convex body, but we take care that it remains compact. And then there are two uh, funk metrics you can be looking at. There is the one you can start with, but also you can look at the funk metric on the image and then pull it back. So we got two different Finster metrics on K and we compare them. Turns out that the difference is going to be an exact one for. And this has the, the very same uh, corollaries. It means that the, well, we already seen that the reflection law is projectively invariant, but it also tells us that the length spectrum of the billiard is going to be uh, a projective invariant of K. Of course, uh, for the uh, Hilbert metric, that's something you would get automatically, but here uh, we had to work for it uh, a little bit. Uh, similarly, uh, one other thing that uh, it implies, if you have a submanifold M inside K, it inherits uh, some Finster metric from the Funk metric, and then you can be looking at its volume, you can be looking at geodesics on M, you can be looking at closed geodesics and taking their length, that would be the length spectrum. All, all those are going to be uh, projective invariants. Uh, projective invariance uh, of K and M. Okay, uh, so uh, I'll skip this explanation. Uh, so so far, once again, uh, for Hilbert metric, you'd have all of that for free. You wouldn't need to be proven in the, in the theorems. So here is the one point where Funk metric offers a, a clear advantage. And that's when you look at projective duality. So, uh, so let's look at projective duality. So uh, P is going to be the usual copy of the projective space. It's going to be a projectivization of Rn plus one. And we're also going to look at the dual projective space. That's the projectivization of the dual uh, linear space. And uh, you can identify it with uh, hyperplanes of the original projective space. Uh, now, uh, a convex set in projective space, by definition, is uh, something which is uh, compact and convex in uh, some affine chart. If you can find an affine chart where it is compact and convex. Now, uh, for uh, such a body, you can construct a dual convex body, denoted like so. Uh, it consists of all hyperplanes which uh, don't intersect the interior of K. And uh, it's uh, not hard to see that uh, it's also going to be a convex body. Its boundary consists precisely of those hyperplanes which are tangent uh, to the boundary of K. Okay, and here comes the, the big duality result. So we look at... Uh, a pair of convex bodies, K sits inside the interior of L. And uh, I also need to tell you what is the reverse funk metric. Uh, sorry, reverse funk metric. I keep forgetting about the, the great vowel shift uh, that uh, made funk sound like uh, funk in uh, the English speaking world. So uh, that's just when, uh, because the metric is non-symmetric, you can just switch the order and you get a new metric. That's called the reverse funk metric. Uh, okay, so uh, if K sits inside uh, L, then when you look at the dual pictures, the dual of L is going, or the polar of L, sorry, sometimes, sometimes I say uh, dual instead of polar, and I'm not quite sure of saying dual bodies. It's okay, so I'll try to say polar. Uh, so the polar of L sits inside the polar of K. And here are the duality results. For one thing, uh, the volume of K inside L 
coincides with the volume of L polar inside K polar. Uh, the other thing is if you look at uh, billiard orbits here, then they're going to be in bijective correspondence with the billiard orbits uh, inside L polar with respect to the metric of K polar. And the length of the corresponding closed orbits are going to be the same. And something similar happens on the boundary. So you can measure the surface area of K with respect to the induced Finster structure for the, from the Funk metric of L. And once again, the one here equals the one here. And you can also look at closed geodesics on this surface. Uh, and they're going to correspond to closed geodesics on this surface, and they're going to have the same length. OK, that's, uh, that's a lot of duality. Uh, let's uh, compare it with something that's, uh, that's well known and well established. Uh, what happens when k is much smaller than L? So uh, in this case, just like uh, in the, you would expect in the Romanian setting, uh, you get something uh, translation invariant. So uh, if k is much smaller than the funk geometry inside k is almost the same as a norm on the tangent space uh, somewhere there, with L uh, being homothetical. Uh, with L being the, the unit ball, essentially, of this norm. OK, so what are the corresponding results in this uh, in this setting? Well, the first one doesn't tell you anything. It just becomes a tautology. Uh, the second one is already uh, interesting. Uh, that's the uh, duality that was observed by Gutkin and Tabashnikov for Minkowski billiards. If you look at the convex body K inside the norm space with unit ball L, or if you look at the polar to L inside the normal space with unit ball minus K, uh, they have the, the same kind of correspondence of uh, billiard orbits. Um, and and uh, similarly for the, the boundaries, so uh, the equality of the volume of the boundaries is a theorem of Holmes Thompson uh, from 79. And the correspondence of geodesics that's a more recent result. It was conjectured by Schaeffer and proved by uh, Alvarez Paiva in 2006. Uh, so uh, what we have in the funk setting is uh, a generalization of those results. Okay, so uh, now uh, I want to show you a picture of how to see this duality of orbits. Uh, so instead of doing playing the whole game uh, on just one picture on the left, we can think about billiard dynamics as taking alternating step, steps, one step in the projective space and another step in the dual space. Here is how it goes. You go from Q0 to Q1, you're going in the direction of Q0, so you arrived at Q1. OK, what do you do? So you've been staying at the, at the direction point P0 here. So the correspondence between right and left is as follows. Every point on uh, a body cor corresponds to a tangent hyperplane. A tangent hyperplane here is the point here. So we were going the direction P0. We were standing in the direction point P0 here. We arrived at Q1. OK, we're looking at this new tangent hyperplane. It corresponds to a direction point here. Now here we're doing a reverse billiard. That means that we're going not towards the direction, but from a direction. So we're going from the direction Q1, starting from P0, we arrive at P1. Okay, P1 corresponds to the point P1, which is here. That's our new direction. We're now heading in the direction P1. So with this uh, picture, it now becomes clear that uh, we have a duality of orbits, but uh, the equality of lengths is still a bit mysterious. So uh, let me, hey, why is that moving? Stop moving. Um, so uh, maybe before I explain why we have such an equality, I'll give you an example and try to make a picture. So uh, let's look at the two periodic orbit. So a two periodic orbit is uh, as follows. Uh, 
you have four tangent lines and I was practicing for them to all intersect in one line and one point that almost worked. Okay, so we have here Q0, Q1, P0, and P1. And the corresponding lines, P1, Q0, Q1, and P0. That's a two, what a two periodic orbit looks like. And uh, the length of this orbit, well, because we're going along the same interval in both direction, it's a uh, total funk length is the same as the Hilbert distance of those two points, uh, which is the logarithm, or why is that? Which is the logarithm of the cross ratio of those four points, uh, which is the same as the uh, cross ratio of uh, the four lines as you uh, might recall from projective geometry. And that's already the length of the corresponding dual orbit. So uh, at least here it's uh, believable, but uh, again, that's uh, not explained in the general case. So uh, let me explain the general case. Uh, for this, uh, let's start again by looking at the Minkowski billiards where uh, this was uh, well established before known before. Uh, so uh, here, here is one transparent way to, to see the equality uh, of uh, corresponding dual orbits. Uh, what you do, you look at the body K times K polar, uh, which sits uh, inside the, the product of uh, the linear space and this dual, which is the same as the cotangent space to n. And uh, the billiard uh, orbit just lifts to, uh, to an orbit of the rib uh, flow on the boundary of this set under the standard contact structure. Uh, and uh, moreover, the length of the corresponding uh, orbit is equal to the action, uh, the action of this uh, rib orbit, which is the integral over the corresponding curve of uh, the contact form. So that's some standard things in uh, basic uh, uh, dynamics. Uh, I, I'm sweeping, swiping, putting under the, the rug uh, the, the minor complication that this product uh, is not uh, smooth, uh, that this boundary is not smooth, but uh, that's uh, really not important right now. Oh, uh, okay, that's Minkowski. What are we going to do in the funk setting? Well, uh, here the main idea is that uh, instead of working in the cotangent space, we're going to work in P times a P dual. Uh, so uh, in two words, what's, what's happening is that uh, for any point eta in the polar of L, you can think of it as a, a hyperplane at infinity. And once you have a hyperplane, hyperplane at infinity, you can define the funk metric. And that gives you a certain map from this product, which sits in P times P polar, to the, well, the, the funk cobol bundle, which sits in the cotangent space to P. So you get a lot of those maps corresponding to all the different funk metrics you can get. But uh, what's nice is that uh, here on the left-hand side, the everything that's related to the dynamics uh, is uh, in fact projectively invariant. So uh, that's maybe uh, some key sentences. Now let me give it to you in uh, some, some more detail. So uh, let's uh, define the set Z. That's the bad set. We're not going to, we're trying to stay away from it. That's the set of all points, of all pairs of a point lying inside the hyperplane. So that's a, a subset of the product. And uh, the key observation is that on the complement of the set, there are some canonical objects which are projectively invariant. There is a canonical symplectic form and uh, there is a, well, the, a, a corresponding uh, measure, which is the, the top 
power of the symplectic form. And for instance, now uh, it's not hard to believe the duality of volumes. It, one can check that the funk volume of k with respect to l is just the volume of this uh, product of k times l polar. And uh, it, when it's written in this form, it's the duality is completely obvious. Uh, and uh, the, the, with the dynamics, the, the story is similar. So while there is no preferred uh, contact form on this product of p times p, p polar, but actually a symplectic form suffices. So uh, how does it work? If you have a hypersurface uh, H, then you can talk about uh, characteristic curves, uh, gamma, which are integral curves of the uh, kernel of the restriction of the symplectic form to this hypersurface. And you can talk about the uh, action of uh, closed uh, characteristic curves. Uh, namely, you just uh, fill, fill it in with a two-dimensional disk and you integrate the symplectic form over the disk. Okay, so one has to be careful with topology, but our topology is not going to be uh, a problem. Um, okay, and uh, so what, uh, what one can uh, observe at this point is that uh, a pillar trajectory, gamma, uh, corresponds to a characteristic curve. So if you look at the picture, picture from before, it uh, alternates between uh, P and uh, P-dual. So we have uh, one interval like this, then on the dual side and, uh, and so on. And uh, the length of this curve is, uh, of the orbit is uh, going to be exactly the, the action. Uh, of this characteristic curve. And now the duality is clear. When you replace uh, this uh, metric with uh, this metric, the symplectic form changes sign due to the change in order. The uh, direction of gamma switches because you're now looking at the reverse uh, metric and uh, the action doesn't change. Okay, and uh, maybe just uh, two words. Uh, that was about the billiards. If you now want to establish the duality of uh, geodesics on the surface of uh, K or L polar, you uh, pretty much just uh, follow the proof of Alvarez fiber. It goes through, uh, you construct just a map between the corresponding cosphere bundles, which uh, respects the restrictions of the corresponding symplectic form. And uh, that's uh, sufficient for the uh, stated results. Okay, I think that's that's all I wanted to say. So I'll stop uh, here and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mitya, for a very interesting talk. Uh, so any questions or comments? Can you, uh, so I think uh, I, I've seen, uh, if, if you quantize the usual billiard, right, you get uh, Laplace and inside and then some, I don't know, uh, Dirichlet or Neumann or whatever boundary value problem. And uh, so I, I suspect that you could try and do something similar for the Funk or the Hilbert metric, but uh, I, I, I don't remember the results very well, but, but, but I suppose there should be some, perhaps some duality there as well. I don't know. Well, I, I, I would very much like to know if there is. Uh, I, I don't know how to, to find it. Yeah, yeah, yes, I, I, I agree with you. Okay, okay. I don't know. No, I, I know. And if uh, hmm? I, I know, Katok uh, thought uh, thought about some stuff for for the uh, for yeah. Okay. I have to look at uh, the literature. Uh, okay, pl look. please do, and please uh, send uh, references uh, if you find them. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's a, it, it would be very uh, very nice if there was some manifestation of the duality in a spectral uh, geometric terms, and I have no idea. How to okay, okay, well, I'll, yeah, for sure. I'll see. I'll see. Uh, mm -hmm.
Hi, Stephen. Thanks. Very nice talk. Um, I, I had a very silly question. Um, maybe it doesn't make sense, but is there a way to define these metrics on um, a domain which is not necessarily convex? There is. Uh, yes. So, uh, well, th there is a, there is a recent paper uh, by uh, three authors, who, neither of whose names I will be able to recall right now, but it's called uh, Hilbert metric beyond convexity. So uh, basically, uh, I, one keyword that's relevant is Kobayashi metric. So basically, there is a, dual, a description of the distance in a kind of dual terms as a supremum over some linear functionals of certain. And uh, if you take this uh, dual description, then uh, you can uh, apply it to non-convex domains. Yes. And uh, they, they do it specifically in some complex domains. So there are things, yes. Hmm? in a different direction, for instance, uh, so if you're looking at uh, some manifolds with a projective, uh, uh, convex projective structures, then, uh, well, th then uh, the Hilbert metric uh, translates into some Finster metric on this manifold, which is of course some uh, not convex and uh, translates into some distance function. But that corresponds to a quotient of a convex set. But anyway, uh, I, either way, there's definitely such extensions. Okay, thanks. Two more questions. So let's uh, thank Michi again for a very interesting talk. And so the next seminar will be uh, Dima, so it will be on uh, uh, next next Friday. Next Friday.